Hi, I'm Susan Taylor with Scripps Health in San Diego, California. Please subscribe to our Scripps Health YouTube channel. We've got great videos featuring the latest technology, our stellar doctors, and inspiring patient stories. So, you've been trying to have a baby with no luck. How do you deal with fertility issues? It is such an emotional subject, so we want to give you as much information as possible to help you make an informed decision. Joining us to talk about this are two OBGYNs, obstetricians and gynecologists, Dr. Renee Nelson with Scripps Clinic in La Jolla, California, and Dr. Brooke Friedman, who is a fertility specialist at Scripps and the San Diego Fertility Center in San Diego, California. Thank you both so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go back to the basics. What causes infertility? Age is the co most common cause of infertility in women. Um, as a woman ages, her eggs become abnormal. It makes it more difficult to conceive and carry a baby to term. Uh, endometriosis can cause scar tissue. And, and what is endometriosis? Endometriosis is where the lining of the uterus grows outside of the uterus in the pelvis or on the ovaries and it can cause um, scar tissue that can prevent conception from occurring. Mm -hmm. um, also, it can block the fallopian tube so the egg and sperm can't meet. Uh, there can also be abnormalities of the man's sperm, which can lead to couples being infertile. Um, there are also many different types of hormone imbalances that can cause a woman not to ovulate on time or not to ovulate at all, um, which can lead to infertility as well. What about um, a uterine fibroid? What is that? So fibroids are basically a smooth muscle ball, as a benign tumor in the uterus. And if a fibroid is small and not close to where a pregnancy needs to grow, it's not gonna cause a problem with fertility. But if fibroids get quite large, or if they're impacting the cavity of the uterus where a pregnancy needs to grow, then that can cause a challenge as far as fertility. So most people think of infertility as the woman's issue, as the woman's problem, but that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Talk oh, about the, the problems not. with the man's uh, sperm. And I think a lot of women, you know, initially always blame themselves, but, you know, at least 25% of the time at or least. more, mm -hmm. it's the man. It um, and, and they often have no idea, they have no reason to suspect it, but they can have a shortage of sperm where they don't make enough. They can be an abnormal shape that causes them not to move as well. They can be too slow to make it to the ovary uh, or the egg on time. Um, some men don't have any sperm at all. Mm -hmm. Interesting, okay, so what happens to a woman's eggs and the man's sperm as we get older? So our fertility as women is a little bit unfair. So we're born with all of our eggs and we lose them over time. And so because of that, there's a decline in egg quality as we age. And men get to make new sperm every 70 days, forever. So it's not really fair, but that's what we're stuck it's with. It's not fair. It's not, <laughs> it's not fair. But that's really the fundamental biologic difference that accounts for why women have a harder time reproducing in later life and men have an easier time reproducing as they get older. That's not, there still is a small impact of, of paternal age on fertility. It's not to say there's no impact, but nowhere near to the degree, unfortunately, that our age as women really impacts our fertility. So what happens to the egg as, as the woman gets older? So the egg is a single cell that we're born with. So over time, those eggs accumulate genetic mutations, so missing or extra chromosomes. And therefore, it will be harder for that embryo then to be a healthy embryo and have the correct number of chromosomes to implant in the uterus successfully and develop. So as well as a decline in fertility, there's unfortunately an increased risk of miscarriage. And don't, don't the, doesn't the woman's eggs get harder as she gets older too? Um, not so much in terms of harder, but the, the main challenge is those missing or extra chromosomes I as see. we age, yeah. Okay. And what about the man's sperm? What happens to that as, the, as a man ages? So there tends to be a decline in motility and like Dr. Nelson mentioned, morphology, the shape of the sperm. So the sperm quality can decline as well as men age. So a lot of people are putting off having kids, but the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, say that 20% of women in the U.S. are having their first child after the age of 35. Is this too late? Well, unfortunately, like Dr. Friedman said, you know, it's kind of unfair. The age at which we're best to reproduce is not really the age at which most of us are ready financially, mm -hmm. mentally, psychologically. So 
in the ideal world, we would all have our children when we were 22, 23 years mm -hmm. old. Um, but for most of us, that's not the right time. So, you know, putting it off till over 35, you know, is a gamble for, for mm -hmm. many people and definitely not recommended if your lifestyle, you know, enables you to have mm -hmm. children sooner. I would definitely recommend trying a little earlier than that if you can, but. Yeah. I would add it just, you know, it also depends a little bit on your family building goals. So mm -hmm. sometimes I'll see couples that conceive really easily when they were 35 but are now coming back to see me and she may be 39. So, at, you know, every, every, as the years advance and we get closer to 40, it can become that much harder. So it depends a little bit on your family building goals too. So let's say what are your chances of getting pregnant in your 20s, 30s, 40s? In your 20s, you've got at least a 90, 95% chance that you're going to conceive, especially within a year. Within a year, okay, that, that there's a time frame for that. declining, you know, as long as you're less than 35, you're still 75, 80%, when then it starts going down from there, um, you know, especially after the age of 40. So if you're in your 30s, what's your what's the, the chance of getting pregnant each month? Yeah, so the most fertile couple in the world in their 20s is about a 25% chance of getting pregnant each month. Um, but by the time we're 40, there's a less than 5% chance. Um, so it does really change dramatically as we age. So if you are having problems getting pregnant, um, how long should you wait before you go see a doctor? Well, you have to look at if a woman is having regular menstrual cycles or not. I always tell my patients if they are not having regular cycles, then they need to come in a lot sooner. If they are, generally, if a woman is under the age of 35, it's recommended to try for about a year if their cycles are regular. Mm -hmm. If over the age of 35, typically we recommend trying, um, tr starting to do tests when they're um, six months from trying. Yeah. And so, so what kind of tests um, can be performed to determine the cause of, of not being able to get pregnant? So we have to gather the puzzle pieces. So there's a lot of different moving parts. So we have to look at egg supply, and we can do that a couple different ways, but a blood test can be very helpful. Checking to make sure the fallopian tubes are open, and that's typically done with a test in radiology where they put dye in the uterus to make sure the tubes are open. And um, explain to the folks what fallopian tubes are. Yes, so basically <laughs> the uterus has these tubes, and they're, they're basically, if you look at the picture, it looks like a Texas longhorn. That's not really what it looks like, but there's little finger-like projections at the end of the tube that have to pick up the egg, and the sperm has to swim into the uterus, up into the fallopian tube to fertilize the egg in the tube. So it's very important that the fallopian tube's open, otherwise the sperm and egg are not gonna have an opportunity to meet. Any other tests that need to be performed? We definitely need to check out uh, the male partner in the couple and, and do an analysis of the sperm or semen analysis. And also, usually an ultrasound is performed of the woman's uterus and ovaries to make sure all of um, that looks normal and you know, checking hormones as well. So in a couple of minutes, we're gonna talk about uh, the emotional toll that infertility can take on you and your partner because miscarriage is also a part of this equation. So we're gonna come back and talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Um, let's talk about the treatment options. Let's say that um, uh, you, know, you have some fertility issues. What kind of treatment options are available? Well, the good news is we have wonderful treatment options available. So if you are struggling with infertility, I just would want people to know that they're not alone. So um, there's wonderful fertility options, really depending on what the cause of infertility is. So if a woman's not ovulating, sometimes there's medications to help her ovulate or the ovary to release an egg. There's IUI or intrauterine insemination, and there's also IVF or in vitro fertilization. What are those? Yeah, so many of my many of my patients refer to IUI as the turkey baster approach. So basically, that's when a man would provide a sample of sperm, we would process that sperm in the lab, concentrate the sperm into a tiny catheter, and that catheter goes inside the uterus closer to where it needs to go, typically in conjunction with a woman taking medication to have the ovary release more than one egg. So we're trying to get higher numbers of sperm closer together to those egg targets. That's what we consider our low-tech approach of IUI or intrauterine insemination. Okay. And IVF, or in vitro fertilization, is more of our high-tech approach. And IVF is what? So IVF is when a woman takes medication to encourage the ovaries to make multiple eggs, and those eggs are taken out with a surgical procedure, and then the eggs are fertilized with sperm in the lab, and then that fertilized egg or embryo goes back into the uterus. And so when you're doing that, if you're trying to get more than one egg to be fertilized, how many 
how many will you try and get and then implant back into the uterus? So that's a really good question. And so as fertility ha treatment has gotten more and more effective and successful, we are really advocating transferring just one single embryo. So, and I know that our OBGYN colleagues, <laughs> we're all on board on that. Our goal is one healthy baby at a time. So a singleton pregnancy, which is why we typically recommend transferring one embryo. And then uh, fertility medications, uh, what are they and how do they work in terms of hormonal imbalance? Well, it depends on what the problem is, but one of the medications that um, general OBGYNs often prescribe is called Clomid. It's an oral medication that is used to help a woman who is not ovulating or maybe not ovulating early enough in her cycle, kind of tricks her body into thinking that she needs more stimulating hormone. Um, so that comes from the brain to stimulate the ovaries. And so that's something that is successful in certain types of hormone imbalances where they can just take a pill at home for five days in the cycle and that can sometimes work to um, help a patient to ovulate. Sometimes um, other hormone imbalances or for the process of initiating in vitro fertilization, they actually have to use injections of hormones to stimulate the ovaries, mm -hmm. which is something that you have to see a fertility specialist for. <laughs> <laughs> and what, um, what is PCOS? What is that? That's polycystic ovarian syndrome. So that is a pretty common disorder, mm -hmm. which we see in a lot of women where there's a predominance of male hormones, which is typically caused by actually by a resistance to insulin. So these imbalances can cause a woman to not ovulate at all or to ovulate extremely late in the cycle where the egg isn't very good anymore or the lining of the uterus is old and not prepared to receive the egg. And also it makes it harder to get pregnant when you don't no idea when you might ovulate in the cycle. So um, that is a disorder that can be treated sometimes mm -hmm. with Clomid and, and other medications. Um, we see it often in women who are very overweight. Um, that can play a big role in hormone imbalances. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what about a high level of prolactin? Explain what prolactin is and what is that high level? Because I know that that's a really long word. That's really it is mouthful. hyperprolactinemia. It's a mouthful. Um, so it's a relatively uncommon cause of infertility. Pro prolactin is a hormone where if it's secreted by the brain at higher amounts than is normal, it can cause irregular periods and um, other impacts which can make it a little bit harder to get pregnant. But typically, if someone has that, um, they're gonna have other symptoms such as irregular periods or which sort of tip them off to that to be evaluated. Um, so let's talk about um, donor eggs and also donor sperm. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something that is a big part of our toolbox. So we've hel helped many, many um, patients conceive with assisted reproductive technology in terms of what we call third-party reproduction, donor eggs, donor sperms, or surrogacy. Um, and it can be a really wonderful way for people to build their family. And so how, what's, the, what's the process? Let's say that your eggs are not working anymore and you want to yeah. you know, you get a donor egg. How do you go about that? So there's different ways. So, so at my clinic at San Diego Fertility Center, we do have our own egg donor database. And so patients can look at the egg donor database and select an egg donor that they feel like is a good match for them. And then that young woman under the age of 30 is going to go through the process of taking medications. We'd retrieve her eggs with the procedure, typically fertilize her eggs with the intended parent's husband's sperm create that embryo and then transfer the embryo to the egg donor recipient. And um, what about donor sperm? Let's say a woman's eggs are, are fine, but she, you know, she needs the donor sperm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we see this in mm -hmm. many types of couples. Sometimes mm -hmm. same-sex couples, mm -hmm. they need a sperm donor. Or if the man's sperm is so abnormal that even IVF is not going to mm -hmm. solve the problem, mm -hmm. there's banks where you can mm -hmm. pick out um, uh, sperm based on many characteristics of the of the man, um, mm -hmm. so they can look and maybe be as close to the mm -hmm. the husband as possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and all single moms by choice. You know, right. seeing a lot of women who maybe they haven't found Mr. Right, and they're choosing to then um, start that process to parenthood. So, all right. So let's come back to this. Let's talk about the emotional toll um, that infertility can take on you and your partner because miscarriage is also a big part of this equation. Yeah. 
So infertility can really cause a tremendous toll, not just on um, the individual, but the couple, the, the relationship of the couple. And so it's important that we try to emphasize that infertility really affects one out of every eight couples. So these patients going through it are not alone. Um, it's very common and it's a medical disorder like really any other. So those patients who are struggling with infertility need that extra emotional support um, because it is such an emotional journey, but they're not alone and we do a very effective treatment, which is the good news. So, but what are the odds of miscarriage? How common is it? Well, at least 25% of all recognized pregnancies will miscarry, and that's from getting your positive pregnancy test to you know, the first three months of the pregnancy. So that is also very, very common, mm -hmm. um, and um, that's important to know that just because you have a miscarriage doesn't mean you won't be able to have a baby, mm -hmm. um, because it is, many women have a miscarriage and go on to have you know, many healthy babies after that. Mm -hmm. So what's the cause of miscarriage? So most miscarriages are caused by missing or extra chromosomes in the embryo or the pregnancy then being genetically abnormal. So it's really important. We always try to emphasize if someone's gone through a miscarriage, it's, it's not her fault. You know, It's really very common for women to blame themselves and feel like it's something I did to cause this, but, but that's really not the case. So what causes you to have a miscarriage? Well, typically something isn't right, you know, with the pregnancy. So either the embryo is abnormal or even a little later in the first trimester, the development might not be normal of the organs and basically can cause the, you know, pregnancy just to stop living. You know, something mm -hmm. I always tell patients, it's like nature, mother nature is, knows that this isn't normal mm -hmm. and is taking care of the problem before it gets to the point of where the parents may have to make decisions about is this baby normal or not, mm -hmm. you know that is taken care of a lot of the time for us, you know. Fortunately, I think that uh, that is the case. You know, I, I like to remind people that when they have a miscarriage that, you know, of course they should be sad about it, but on the, on the flip side that something wasn't right with it. And so they really want a healthy, normal baby. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they have to kind of move on to the next pregnancy and, and focus on that rather than focusing on the loss. Mm -hmm. But what about, what about some outside factors like smoking, excessive alcohol, extreme weight gain or loss, or excessive physical or emotional stress? Can I um, just go through that whole yeah, list? Yeah, no, those are good questions. I mean, certainly there are certain environmental exposures, like cigarette smoking does increase the risk of, of miscarriage. Um, extreme obesity can also increase the risk of miscarriage. Um, so there are definitely, you know, uncontrolled diabetes. There are certain medical conditions that can increase the risk of miscarriage. Um, so certainly those are factors that, you know, uh, OBGYN would go through a patient and, and try to reduce or eliminate those risk factors. Excessive alcohol? Absolutely. I mean, I think that tends to be a lower cause of miscarriages, mm -hmm. at least in our population. Yeah. But, but certainly, you know, that definitely contributes to abnormal embryos, which would then result mm -hmm. in miscarriage. So how do, you, how do you minimize the chances of miscarriage? And what should you do, I guess, to prepare before you try to get pregnant? I think the most important thing is trying to have your babies younger, if you can, <laughs> yeah. and then just being healthy, you know, yeah. not, not anything too extreme, but eating a healthy diet, not mm -hmm. smoking, exercising, mm -hmm. you know, a, a realistic amount. You know, also we can see problems with people who do things to excess, you mm -hmm. know, excess mm -hmm. training for you know, marathons, triathlons, you know, athletes, you know, dancers, things like that can sometimes have difficulty also because they're on the extreme end of fitness. So is there an ideal age to try and get pregnant? So ideally, if someone wants a larger family, it's best to start trying as soon as possible. So we're most fertile in our 20s, but that may not be the right time, like Dr. Nelson was saying, from other aspects to get pregnant. From a fertility perspective, uh, we're at our peak in our, in our 20s. But certainly, if someone wants a larger family, starting that journey under age 35 would be important, because as we move into our later 30s, or particularly closer to 40, it can become substantially more difficult to get pregnant. So you folks deal with the, the highest of highs, I think, and I suspect you know, with miscarriage as well, you deal with the lowest of lows in terms of um, the emotion. How do you cope with the emotional toll that fertility issues can have, those extreme emotional highs and lows? Well, I think one important thing is you know, 
letting the patient know that it's it's not their fault, they're not causing this to happen, that you know they didn't do anything wrong. You know, most of the time it isn't something that they they, they did wrong, um, and just helping them, you know, and support them through that because I think blaming themselves or blaming each other can cause more problems in the relationship and um, you know turn something that's supposed to be a healthy fun activity into something mm -hmm. that's very stressful and mm -hmm. you know can cause lots of problems with the marriage. Yeah, absolutely. And I typically often uh, encourage patients if they're having a hard time to seek help, you know, absolutely. See a mental health professional, um, there are support groups and just to know that they're not alone. Um, and it's really important to know that there there are options, there's support and, and there's help. Let's say someone is having fertility issues and they have to use fertility treatments many times in order to become pregnant. Um, those, does, that does that take a toll on someone if they, if they do it too much fertility using those fertility treatments? Well, I think you know, fertility treatments are not. You know, when you're trying to get pregnant, it's every month feels like an eternity. You know, it's, it's forever till you ovulate, forever till like you, you find out if you're pregnant. So certainly as the months you know, turn more, like more than a year, that, that can be a painful process. And so certainly fertility treatment can be challenging. That's why it's important to assemble a team, um, both medically and sort of also socially, and have that support to help you through it. But let's say you're taking hormone injections mm -hmm. and you're taking them, you know, if you want to have two or three kids and you're having a really hard time conceiving, can ingesting all those extra hormones take its toll on your body later on in life? Is there any risk for it? Yes, yeah, so the good news is um, studies have been very reassuring to that effect. And so fertility injectable medication has really not been shown to increase the risk of disorders like breast or ovarian cancer, so patients should really feel reassured that the medications they're taking to get pregnant are not going to negatively impact their health downstream later on. Any final thoughts? I think it's most important just to remember that, you know, the, the relationship that started the whole process is mm -hmm. important and sometimes everyone gets so focused on, on the baby that they forget about each other and they forget about, um, you know, what initially started the whole mm -hmm. journey and, uh, but, and also remembering that there's lots of options out there for having a family. There's Absolutely. many different ways to be parents. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's a lot of different paths to, to building a family. So knowledge is power. So it's really important if you're struggling to conceive to try to get some answers. So particularly if you're over age 35 and it's been over six months, see your OBGYN for an evaluation. It's important to have that fertility evaluation, to have a semen analysis done to check the partner, to gather those puzzle pieces. Knowledge is power. So when you have that information, you're in a better position to really evaluate your next steps. Knowledge is power. I like that. Thank you both so much for being with us. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. If you want more information on fertility and miscarriage, please click on the link or go to scripts.org forward slash videos. Want more critical information about your health? We take care of you from head to toe. Please subscribe to our Scripps Health YouTube channel and follow us on social media at Scripps Health. I'm Susan Taylor. Thanks so much for joining us. It's our mission at Scripps to help you heal, enhance, even save your life.